Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the X-Ring. Thanks for joining in this evening. I know two nights in a row, and I normally don't do live broadcasts that often, but I had a really, really nice treat for you tonight. Uh, we have Chris Way, professional shooter. I'm going to go ahead and bring him in right now, and we'll see if we can. Why don't you say hello, Chris? Hey, everybody. All right, so uh, basically, guys, this is Chris Way. I'll kind of fill you in uh, on a little bit of his background. Basically, he is a pro shooter. You shoot for a couple of different companies. I'll let you name off your sponsors, uh, maybe from your most important to your least or in any order that you like. Man, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah, uh, exactly. So any order that you like. No particular order. I've got yes. XLR, Burger, Proof Research. Uh, I've got uh, Armageddon gear. And and I'm I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting um, get light and uh, softly softly okay. hit me pretty well. Uh, they're outside the shooting world, but they've I've been with them for almost six years. Nice. All right, guys. So just a little bit of background on this. Uh, met Chris in 2018. I was shooting at the uh, competition dynamics match. It was the team safari. The steel challenge i guess it was it was at the blue steel ranch in logan new mexico that, that's when we first met yeah and we had a lot of common interest i mean he, you do a ton of rock climbing back in the day i guess and i did a lot of rock climbing something i don't really talk about on the channel but uh guys chris over here legit real deal i mean he's one of these guys that when you meet him he's going to he's going to make an impression on you i mean physically fit like nobody's business right i mean how many miles do you run a week it depends what i'm running but you use about 40. okay 40 so you know there's a there's something that i wanted to talk about bringing you in is you know i've gotten into this world of prs because i originally started off doing more the sniper matches doing ruck style matches what i'm seeing with prs is i'm not seeing a lot of overlap where you see the prs shooters that are doing the ruck matches is that a fair statement or no I mean, there's a few, yeah. but not not many. No. Now, why why would you think that is? Now, you're out west. You're you're out towards Colorado and Wyoming, that area. Uh, honestly, that I think that's a really good question, and, and and I came into the sport through field matches, so I was surprised to find out that there were fewer field match shooters than PRS style shooters, and and I think that that the accessibility to shooting ranges. It's higher than the access to uh, the knowledge on how to physically train and how to keep your body performing at a higher level as we get older. You know, I think that, that you and I, we're kind of a rare breed. As, as people leave their 20s, I think they start to leave behind any idea of exercise and getting out and doing stuff. And, um, you know, hanging on to little bits, you know, they go to the range and shoot, but, but, but the, the convenience of having to drive there and, and, and not hike around in the mountains. Uh, yeah, no, make, I agree with you. I think that's a fair around. statement. That, that's what I think. And, and also, uh, it's very hard to judge a match that's in the field compared to a match that's on a flat range because you know you got impact, impact, impact. But if you got to walk 10 miles and be scored on, on um, other skill sets, it can be challenging to organize an event like that. Yep. And, and uh, the competition dynamics guys do it really well. I've heard that the, uh, there's an RTC I've never done in the Pacific Northwest that might do some field type uh, shooting. Uh, but but other events, I think I have a hard time scoring stages that involve skill sets other than, you know, hit, miss shooting. Yeah. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell on Chris a little bit, guys. And we do have some PRS shooters in here, Chris. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tiffy in here, he does a lot of PRS style shooting. Uh, a lot of guys in here that are into the long range shooting. So I'm going to tell on Chris. Chris has competed in the, the SAC. It's the SAC, the Sniper Adventure Challenge. I've never competed in that. That is, from what I understand, if I'm incorrect, just correct me on this, Chris. That's basically a 48 hour nonstop race that covers everything from long range, carbine, pistol, land nav, field craft, problem solving. And the shooting is only about 20, 25% of your score. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the actual score formula, uh, I'm not I'm not able to speak intelligently about it. Uh, you're going to have to have Zach on. Zach's oh, yeah, on. Zach is – I don't even understand the scoring of some of these other ones, uh, but I guarantee it's right. 
Now, in 2017, you guys came in second place. 2018, you came in third. And 2019, you won it outright. That's right. That's right. So and why how aren't you at Mammoth right now? <laughs> I don't know. I, that's a good question. I've, I've, it's not in my, my calendar. So by the time registration opens and closes, I usually, that's when I hear about it. Like, oh, yeah. registration's closed. Like, well, shit. Yeah, I had so many emails. Why aren't you shooting Mammoth? I'm like, I have so much going on right now. But uh, no, I just wanted to give everybody some uh, some background on you. You know, you're shooting professionally. You did the, the Sniper Adventure Challenge. And, and guys, the, the title of this was The Assassin's Way. Now, Chris is one of the guys that's actually going to be competing in Assassin's Way. Now, Assassin's Way is a 23-day adventure style match with shooting starts in texas i guess you guys start september the first and the entry fee for you to compete is twenty five thousand dollars is that correct yeah that's correct but what are you going to do with the half million dollar prize money when you win that <laughs> man i'm gonna uh, pay off my credit cards for all the primers i've had to buy yeah no doubt primers are tough to come by and all the people are ho uh, hoarding all the varget right now yeah yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's been podcasts with Jacob Bynum, who owns Rifles Only, that's, that's yep. putting from the competition. I I think that, that he probably said it best, which is the, the kind of person that's going to come to a match like that is going to find a way to do it, regardless of the entry fee and regardless of the prize, yep. just the experience. And I feel like, you know, he kind of pinned me right there when I went down to Rifles Only this year. And afterwards, he pulled me aside and said, Chris, we're going to launch this match. I think this is up your alley. And as soon as he told me about it, I said, you know, sign me up and um, kind of redirected all my training towards that event. Uh, last week, uh, they made an announcement that the competition is postponed until 2022. So are, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. yeah wow. because, of, uh, because of of COVID related coordinations and stuff so but what they're going to do is they're going to have smaller and I, I don't think this is out but this is live and 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 i've already yeah. started talking out my ass so there will be a few smaller assassin's way style events that'll be broadcast to show sponsors to show uh people that are going to watch the event uh what it's going to be like and and the participants are going to participate in those as well uh yeah. so there'll be three plus day events that, that kind of prime the participants because there'll be a lot of media attention to this. Now, let me ask you this. Was that supposed to be 23 continuous days of being out or are you going to have hotels and things like that along the way? I know you guys had ammunition depots along the way where you could basically refuel. Um, but is that 23 days out and about? Uh, yes and no. So what, what happens is, um, largely the events analog which is really appealing to me i think that and, and what i mean by analog is we don't get range finders we don't get ballistics calculators uh we don't get all the digital devices that might be common at, at a at a local match or a two-day prs style match what we get okay. is the gear on our shoulders and we've got to use that from start to finish so the event starts at rifles only and there's a detailed equipment list what they're going to do is lay out that gear and inventory it and all of that gear is going to be photographed and periodically they're going to stop us and ask us to show, you know, take off our rucks and show us where's, where are all these pieces of equipment? That way we don't leave something behind or try to go light or fast or change things out for the different environments. We're going to start at rifles only, but it's, it's on us to, um, to make the movement to the next range. And so okay. from rifles only, we might be going to Oklahoma. We might be going to, uh, so, you know, so a surrounding state, uh, New Mexico or something like that. And what they're going to say is, you know, here's the location of your next stage. And on it is a start time, a drop dead start time. And that start time includes a Google transit time. So, so if the drive time is six hours, they're going to give us six hours plus six hours, everything okay. plus six hours. So when one stage ends, we'll have drive time plus six hours. If in those six hours extra, you want to get a hotel or go to a restaurant 
or um, take an extra nap, that's great. But we're responsible for getting to that next location and then have six hours downtime on our own. But then we tow the line with our rucks prepared for the unknown. We'll be presented with an unknown challenge of, of you know, unknown distance length. And when that's over, same thing. Here's your next location, six hours plus drive time. We'll see you there. Uh, before- yeah, so you'll you'll have a lot invested in this. Not only do you have the entry fee, but then you've got 23 days out getting around. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Yeah. And, and um, you've noticed it. Not a lot of not a lot of people have noticed it, but be, but because of that, there's been media out saying. If competitors are, are clever, if they're going to do this right, they're going to approach and try to get sponsorships. They're going to yeah. try to get support for that travel and transit. And uh, some people are putting together teams yeah. that are going to travel with them. And my approach has been essentially to restructure my social media and sponsorship quest to um, first build a following uh, through Gun Around the Sun and, and then a YouTube channel to try to get support first from shooters that I could approach larger sponsors. Uh, bigger so companies. I just put this banner up here. Uh, it's The Craft. Isn't that the name of your channel? And you just started it back in September. Yep. And you've already got 400 plus subscribers. So anybody that's watching, we've got 92 of you on here right now. Uh, I know it's a busy night because it's a Saturday night. But uh, yeah, go check them out because it's a good way to learn. I mean, Chris's videos are not about let's review this pistol let's review this gun it's about field craft it's about taking yourself to that next level um you want to explain a little bit more because you have a very unique approach it's kind of like with my channel i don't do a lot of gun reviews you're not going to find a review on a you know a hellcat pistol not that there's anything wrong with it but it's really more about learning so i'll, I'll let you take over from there talk about the channel. sure the the whole idea for the craft wasn't to come up with a channel that's doing a lot of what other people are doing. The last thing I wanted to do is somebody kind of new to the industry, step on people's toes and, 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 and compete for market space. But what I noticed in the first few years of, of being involved in, in the shooting world was that there's a lot of information and that information can be difficult to sort through and get an honest assessment of what it can do in the field. And for me, the, the primary purpose of the channels that I've produced isn't to say you should buy this product or you should buy this product, but rather it's to say, this is how I'm choosing products that I'm going to use personally. So I'm not going to review or use or even mention a piece of equipment that I don't plan on using myself personally in the field. And it's yeah. my personal assessment for my personal use. So it's how am I selecting gear? For Assassin's Way, because I, as soon as it became public, Chris Way's doing Assassin's Way. What gear are you going to use? What scope are you going to use? And all my answers at first were, I don't know. I've broken a lot of equipment. <laughs> yeah, you're hard on equipment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I thought, God, that would be pretty cool to show people: a, what do I do on a weekly basis, and b, how am I going to determine, you know, what's the right caliber, what's the right scope, what's the right barrel. You know, what socks am I going to wear? The way I figure that stuff out and the way I've figured it out for the last 30 years in the mountains is get what I hear is good and then go use it. And after 100 days, I'll know what I want to use. Because if, if, if you ask somebody with intimate knowledge of a piece of equipment because they use it every day, day in and day out, it's not a question. What would you use? They say, I use this because... And they'll list off hundreds and hundreds of examples of how it worked well. And that's really difficult for me to extract from other people because you know, I drop stuff. I, I, I take my rifle out on the rocks. I take it in the snow. And I say, well, how, you know, have you ever dropped it off the back of a snowmobile? No. Shit. Now, right. did, now let Absolutely. me stop you for just a second. Didn't you just do it? And I know you don't, might not want to talk about it yet, but didn't you take like four premium scopes uh, out in the Colorado snow in the mountains for like four or five days, high temperatures of like 16, testing them all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still sorting through the, the data, but I have a loophole Mark V. I have a um, uh, zero compromise. I have a Collis and a Night Force uh, attacker. 
and and I went up to West Yellowstone, and for seven days, essentially went out and shot, and did what I would imagine a difficult event would put, you know, the the conditions that it would put on me and it would put on my gear, and I wanted to see, you know, how does this stuff stand up to the cold, and to bumping into snow and ice and, and, and what kind of things would shooting in those conditions uh, that I might not realize now, what would, what kind of effect would they have? Because if, the thing is, you know, I, I have a unique background, but everybody that I've heard of going to assassin's way has a unique background. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm not going to name names, but we've got professional retired snipers from the army. We've got tier one snipers, Yep. Uh, Canadian snipers. Uh, it's funny. Got, we were talking about them last night. Uh, uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. We've got Swiss, Russians, Australians. Uh, they're businessmen. And, and they all have careers, you know, 20 years of experience doing their thing, which might include shooting in the snow. But I haven't shot a lot in the snow. So... Anything that I've ever done in the past involves immersion in that in in that ecosystem before I start to make decisions on what I'm going to actually do. So if I'm going to take a research trip, and, and I, I would take research trips uh, to, to collect stuff in the past, you know, I would I would find something that was close to it, and then I would go work in it for a while. I would climb, camp, yeah. kind of immerse myself into it to say, all right, what's what's likely? What's the gear that I'm going to need to live so that being comfortable allow me to do my job. Yeah. So we went up to the snow and I brought what I thought I would need and, and I ice climbed. So I'm, I'm familiar with the gear that I would need to do that. So I brought mostly ice climbing gear and then guns and these scopes. Guns are pretty straightforward. You know, a bolt gun is just a tube with a thing that seals it shut. And, and, and so to me that, that doesn't, um, you know, that, that's not super complicated. I know water getting in it can add pressures and so on, but I shoot low pressure anyway. The, the big kind of elephant in the room when it comes to gear breaking tends to be scopes and rings, right? Scopes, rings, and trigger. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I thought, God, 25,000 on the line and 500,000 really on the line. It's worth going up for a week to the snow and beating on some scopes. And um, I'm going to do that kind of back and forth until the event happens. Snow, yeah, desert. you're headed to the water. desert now to test them, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 So, <laughs> so I, and, and I'm perfectly happy uh, being in full disclosure about the things that I notice, And that's kind of what the point of the YouTube channel is going to be. But it's my attitude that if we're going to compete, the things that I do, A, they're not a secret because for you to be at the level that I'm going to be at is going to require that you do that too. Right. Yeah. If I'm going to go run a marathon to beat somebody that can do it in two and a half hours is going to mean that I'm going to have to train my ass off. Right. W which I can't do and I won't do. So they don't have to worry about me. So if I say, well, I'm going to go up to the snow and I'm going to test out this equipment. What harm does it do sharing? Right. A, people will find it entertaining and interesting, even if they never do it. And B, the other competitors, if they're watching me, you know, the, the, the psychological operations have kind of won already because they're looking to me for answers. And, and, um, and the answers to me are pretty straightforward in that whatever I say, I've got the experience now kind of in my marrow and I know what to do when I'm there. And I can tell you, this is what you're going to do. But how many people have you taken to a match for the first time and told them, this is what you're going to do and watch them just execute it perfectly, right? Yeah. Not yeah. going to happen. Not, not going to happen. So, so I'm not too worried about that. What I noticed in the snow was that Mirage from the barrel picks up very fast, and that's unavoidable. So there, there, are, there are insulators that you can put over the barrel. Now, but, see, this, this, let me stop you for just a second. Yesterday, we talked about this. Someone actually asked the question about Mirage. Now, you're talking about Mirage off the barrel heat, but I did say, and I told everyone, you will see Mirage in the snow. If you've got good glass, you can still pick it up. And, you know, the barrel bands and things like that, that a lot of biathlete, you know, shooting biathlons, they will use those. So what are you going to do to mitigate that? Because it tells me that you ran into it as well. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, the mirage comes very fast in the cold. Yes. Uh, one shot out of your barrel and, and you start to see the deviations. And, and so what I would do is I would shoot and then I would continue to shoot and look at the pattern that it printed on the steel at distance to see if that mirage was affecting the bullet impact. And, 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 and I'll probably use the insulating too because it's heat coming off the barrel yep. and um, it happens very fast. And, and I'll probably also have a carbon barrel and the carbon barrels, um, the, the heat travels through them faster than a steel barrel. So if I have a, a thick, um, if I have a thick barrel and I shoot it, it takes a while for that heat to come out. Correct. So if I'm shooting a rifle and I shoot bang with a steel barrel and then bang and bang, I can keep shooting for a while before the heat starts to mirage through the, through the steel. Whereas it only takes a couple shots through the carbon barrel. And so, uh, but knowing that it's coming, right. will allow me to take the precautions that I need to slip something over the barrel and um, make sure that I don't, you know, I don't have any point of impact shifts from having something on that barrel. The other thing, though, is that with the suppressor, uh, the glare that's coming off the snow yep. created a complete whiteout. So well, I'm used to putting down my rifle and shooting, sometimes seeing trace depending on my position, but seeing the target hit and move. And on sub 800 yards, I couldn't see the target. The, the whiteout wouldn't go away before the bullet impacted the steel. Why are you choosing a suppressor? I just brought it up with me. Uh, okay. But, but I think that um, the, 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 I haven't made a decision, but the idea of using a suppressor uh, over a break um, would be that there's um, situational awareness is a big component of the event. So if I'm trying to imagine going out I'm, tr I'm going to imagine trying to use my senses to the best abilities and having my ears unencumbered by something so that I can hear and listen. Yeah. Um, at the Sniper Adventure Challenge, actually, uh, we carry around radios and periodically the staff will uh, have a code that they read out. And depending on where you are, it might be difficult to actually hear. They've got repeaters yeah. set up, but it's not always clear what they're <laughs> saying. You might hear something and say... I think they said blueberry pancakes. And so you write <laughs> down blueberry pancakes and you keep going. But if they do something like that and people are shooting, um, you run the risk of missing something. So I'm kind of erring on the side of, of uh, trying to optimize my senses by being quiet. Yeah. Now, are you running Thunder Beast cans as well? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so I've kind of found the same thing in shooting. Um, I did some videos on this in that if you need that situational awareness or you need communication with you and a partner, uh, the suppressor, it's, it's hard to beat. However, in a PRS environment where you're just shooting PRS, you know, positional shooting, the most effective thing is going to be either a plain muzzle brake or something like the Maverick that's integrated in it. I think uh, when we saw each other last time, that was at the... Uh, team safari and everybody wanted to hear and see how that maverick worked and i'm very impressed with it but since then i did some testing to show how a suppressor can actually <clears throat> hurt your grouping it can um if you put it on a chronograph you will see and like i said i did this with, with poor center x on a rimfire and it makes your extreme spread and your standard deviation increase it, it does and if that's happening, I mean, what, that, well, that's what we're always chasing, right, Chris? I mean, yeah. if we can get those numbers as low as we can, typically we see better groupings. Not always, but typically. And that's what it showed to me. So I was told by the guy that's actually ranked, I think he's either first or second right now uh, in NRL 22X. He said, get rid of the can. I said, it's a Thunder Beast takedown. He said, get rid of the can. He goes, you might not think it hurts, but it does hurt. You know, when we're shooting a quarter inch wide target with these things, uh, he said it will throw it just a little bit. So since then, I've decided to take it off, but I still love them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thoughts, impressions? Do you agree, disagree? I, I, I feel like it's worth continuing to test, but but I would say that, that man, I, I don't disagree from the things that I've seen. And, and it continues from that. I think the I've heard, especially with the 22s, and I, I haven't tested it myself, but 
you know, a lot of people pour, you know, they, they've got their rifle, they put, you know, hold it up, you know, port arms or something, and then carbon falls into All the All the carbon falls out of the suppressor. And you know, bang it and bonk it and, and uh, I've you got... Just, you I've can't got, pick up a gun. You can't pick up a rifle on live. Right, right. Let me just grab a... Here's a... You, you can't pick up a gun. Set it down. Set it down. Oh. Don't, don't, don't kill it. Yeah, YouTube, YouTube, because of active shooters, if, if it detects someone picking up a firearm, uh, they'll kill the channel. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I hate it. But... Meant like at a, at, a, at a match, like you can't pick it up. and No, no, you can't pick it up on live YouTube. How about parts? You can pick up parts. It just cannot be a firearm. Okay. Uh, well, so... So yes, I, I've I've heard the and I and I've I've definitely seen carbon, and heard carbon fall down my twenty two barrel. Um, oh yeah, me too. Especially when I take it off or something, you have just particles everywhere. Yeah, and, and so my uh, this is my six five can, but it, it's pretty banged up, and and so that's clear to me that I hit it on things. <laughs> and yeah. if I hit it on things, then carbon can get loose, and if carbon gets loose. It's going to have an effect on something. Well, we know a lot of the same people. So I know, for example, I know Colin actually sent one of his cans back in because it weighed like six ounces more because of the carbon buildup. Yeah. Now, if we're all talking about harmonics and what it does to our groupings, the longer and longer you shoot a can that you cannot disassemble or service, you're adding more weight, which is essentially changing the harmonics of what's going on. Look, I am pro suppressor 100%. Yeah. I'm just trying to talk about advantages and yeah. disadvantages. Yeah, for sure. And, and when I go, um, I'm not going to pick them up, but but I usually have cloned rifles, and I'll, I'll have one with the suppressor and the other one without it, and I'll go back and forth to do comparisons just to, just to double check. Gotcha. Um, but, but it is something that I noticed up in the snow is that it exacerbates the, the whiteout. Yep. And so that was a disadvantage to the suppressor in the snow. Now, if I was hunting – I don't know what I would do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, All right. Well, let me ask you that. We have 108 people in here. You yeah. you mentioned the four scopes that you tested in the snow. I know you still have a lot of testing. Uh -huh. Without picking one, what would be your top two right now? If somebody said right now you got to pick two of the four, without going into detail or giving anything away from what you've done so far, who comes out at the top two in no particular order? Yeah, Night Force and Collis. The Night Force Attacker 735 and the Collis 525i. Really? They they dominated the snow. Awesome. Yeah. That is good to know. Good to know. Um, I know there were some people on here that commented about the Zero Compromise. I know I've been trying to get my hands on one. And, you know, I was just interested to see because, you know, it does look like it's, you know, it's got, you know, really good knurling on the knobs and everything else, but that's only a small part of the equation. And people have to realize that, that depending on the environment, um, that scope can perform differently. I mean, it might flip around and be the other two when you go to the desert you yeah. know, next week okay. or whatever. Yeah. No. Okay. So, so just the, you know, the asterisk kind of clause, I, I picked four scopes that I knew had a good reputation and, and I've said it on other things. Like I want to compare good with good. I don't yeah. And I don't want to bad mouth anybody. And Correct. I, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Right. So, so they are. There's. I never found anything wrong with any of the scopes. That that I would consider a red flag. It's just okay. that I, I line them up and I did my particular test, and those two came out on top. And I, and I'll tell you, um, you know, rather than saying what 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 didn't perform. I would rather just talk about the, the you know, why, why the knife horse and why, what did I see with the knife horse and what did I see with the collis? And I'll try to pull it off the rifle here while we're talking. Well, while you're doing that, let me ask you this. Why yeah. no Schmidt and Bender or Tangent Theta? Uh, well, I, I, I've actually played with both of those, but they didn't go up to the snow. Um, and uh, the Tangent had the similar qualities to the Zero Compromise. And uh, yeah. The Schmidt and Bender didn't pass the test, but even before we left. So, um, you know, that's funny you should say that because the guys that follow my channel, we've got 115 guys on here right now and gals, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, you know, we had ordered some of the SOCOM Schmidt and Benders, and we had huge tracking issues. I'm not bad mouthing, I'm just saying. And this could happen to a night force, it can happen to everyone. But we ordered two of them, 
at the same time and we had just huge issues with it and i was using schmidt and bender up until that point i was also using one for work but they were the older scopes so i don't know at some point something changed but here recently you guys all know that i'm a huge night force guy i do run the 7 to 35 and the 4 to 16s uh, and I've been playing around with some other ones, but Chris did hit on something earlier when he was talking about me as an individual. I did not want a channel that was just going out and just just taking stuff and getting it for free and reviewing it. And reviewing it OK, yeah, so I didn't get them for free. So. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about my channel. Yeah, you didn't. You actually bought those. But when someone sends me a product, number one, I'm not going to release it until I'm ready to release it, because if it does turn out good and I do endorse it. I want to make sure that I put the time in, uh, that I've really put it through the paces and it's not something, well, they sent it me for free. It's good enough. It'll work for you. Uh, I'm very careful about that because, you know, I said from the beginning and the goes, the guys that watch the channel, um, I'm not going to be a shill for any company. I have to believe in that product and those products will change as different things come out and technology changes. Um, not to say one's bad or whatever, but what made you choose that? And, uh, you know, what I like about your approach is you're testing everything. So yeah. I'm going to let you go ahead and pick up from there now that you got yeah. those released. All right. So I just pulled these off the rifle from the range. Um, and, and so uh, one thing that I did is I swapped them back and forth. So they've been swapped on the rifle uh, back and forth a hundred times. I'll take them off, put them back on. I'll swap the rifles. I'll, I'll re-zero them swap them back and some of the tests are just for me because to be comfortable with making the corrections using the knobs i think you actually have to make corrections looking through it so i'll practice swapping it back and forth and and i know that the point of impact shift between them so it's easy to say all right this is six clicks this is six clicks um so this is the night force attacker and you could see i don't know how good the resolution is but this thing it doesn't look new anymore and that that's because because you were throwing it around in the snow, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I threw it around. And, and you know, when you're out navigating, you end up brushing up against trees and banging on stuff. And, and instead of me just doing that, I figured I'd simulate what, what I would do. But I, I wouldn't do anything to the gear that I wouldn't do to my body uh, because anything beyond that, and I'd break. And, uh, but I could say that um, this is the night force and this is the, the – the collis and i put the collis in a in a spur mount uh because i i don't i don't know if they have rings uh but but i had a, a spur mount here and and then this is the um the night force they both have illuminated reticles which yeah they're pretty cool the the night force has green and red so when you hit the button you can change the color which is kind of neat uh and um you know, especially in different types of light, it's nice to be able to change the color and, and, it, and it picks up your attention a little bit differently. And then um, the collis is red. I think in, in, in the video that I already released, you know, I, I kind of, I called them equal, but I said, if I was going to hold over, I would use the night force because of its reticle. And yep. if I was going to dial, I would use the collis. And, and so let me, let me talk about the, um, the turrets. Uh, for a sec, just to show you how, how they're a little bit different. Um, now, if, if I was out in the field, I wouldn't have the cap over the, the windage knob. And this windage knob is sealed from the environment. So you don't really need it. And bumping it on things, when I was throwing it at stuff, I made sure that it was off just to see if, if I threw it at the trees enough, would the elevation and wind change? And, and none of them had the elevation and wind change. Now, what, what neither of these has is the locking pull-up, pull-down feature. Yep. Like, like, like the, the Razor HD. Right. And the Zero Compromise uh, has that locking feature, which which could be an issue if you bumped it or if, or if somebody else, if something happened and it, and it changed. But I, I never, I've never been able to simulate a condition that changed my elevation or wind. The 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 tactile elevation shift is a little bit clearer in in the night force what i mean is when i click that click is very pronounced and yep. i can feel it through thick gloves and so if i if i'm wearing big fat gloves it's gonna dampen the sensations that i'm having and the night force 
would go through those thick gloves that I've got and I would feel them very, very clearly. Even if I spun it a bunch, I could say, wow, that was seven clicks or seven tenths elevation change. I could feel that very well. And, and I could, and, and, um, the collis is just a little bit more subtle such that I had to pay attention. And, and if I felt like I had gone too far, I would have to go to the zero stop and then pay better attention. And so if it was a time thing or a stress thing, um, I wouldn't have, be able to feel that. And that was part of the, that was part of the testing. But what the, what the collis did really well in the snow is they've got these add-ons. And, 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 and so I bought these add-ons uh, talking with the rep, he said, look, I recommend that you get the uh, parallax. And so that, that's another thing is that the elevation knob is, is where all elevation knobs are. But this left knob isn't parallax. The parallax is actually under the elevation knob. Yeah. And what, what's normally a parallax knob is the illumination dial for the illuminated reticle. But what that allows you to do is reach up with your hand dial your elevation and then adjust without moving parallax without moving your hand without moving your hand and if you hold your scope at all to shoot you don't have to move your hand at all you could you know you could you could get on adjust your elevation adjust your parallax and you can do it with big fat gloves on and i thought that was a really cool feature that i i normally don't put my hand on the scope to shoot but to be able to do this was awesome when it was zero degrees. I mean, it, you know, it's cold and my hands were cold with gloves on trying to do fine motor control is difficult in the cold. And this made it very, very easy. And then you've got this big power knob that sticks up. Yeah. And I like that the high power is, is on the left and the low power is on the right. What the, the only drawback that I found um, to the night force in that department was that the high power puts the knob on the left. And although I'd never shoot a 35 unless it's on paper up close looking at groups or doing observation, when I run the bolt, this my finger hits this knob. So when I run my bolt, my, my bolt hand actually hits the knob and I can't really hold the bolt the same way. And I, I could take this off, but, but that was something that repeatedly happened. And I kept saying, God, that thing is in the wrong place. Um, that, that to go high power, I actually put it more in the line of hitting the bolt. Uh, and it kept hitting the bolt. And then the other thing here is that just because of the, the height of these rings, these rings are actually pretty low. The bolt hits the, um, you know, when it's on, when I shoot it, I shoot around 15, the, the scope cap where I have happened to have it. And I could take the scope caps off cause they get in the way, but, but, uh, but the scope cap band here, it would get in the way of the bolt coming back. So going forward and, and then if I put it to my normal one, then having the bolt come back and it would hit this. So I would say if I would just run it without scope caps and, and yeah. that's kind of the take home message there, but otherwise the night force rings, um, I like better than the than the the collis rings. The collis rings they look big and beefy. Oh, let me stop you there. Are those collis or spurs? I mean spurs, spurs. Yeah. yeah. Now before you go too far, I will tell you I'm a huge fan, and everybody knows that I use the Night Force rings. Now I love spur, but I have broken two crossbars two separate times. So in between bolt number one, if you look at one on the side and four, I've, I've de I developed a crack. Now, both of those were replaced by mile high, no questions asked. And I've since machined those out of titanium, one solid piece. And that's wow. what I run now because I still run the spurs, but I've broken two sets. That's awesome. Holy smokes. That's something that I haven't broke yet. But um, I've, I've heard that I need to look out for some things and I'm still testing them. But the spur mounts make, you know, to me, it made sense to put them in, put them out, swap them, uh, hold it. But um, I've got kind of inconclusive tests out, uh, but but that's what's on here. And, and it, it's not hard to put these, but again, in the cold with gloves on, using fine-tuned equipment like um, a torque wrench, 
and the little bits that fit in those teeth, it is a million times easier to screw on a half inch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and tighten that down and you're ready to rock. It is so much easier to do that. And I did on, I had another spur mount um, in the cold, snow got in it. And when I went to tighten it, it stripped out those little threads. And, and I've had that on a couple different uh, sets of rings where just because of my testing, I'm doing high repetition, high repetition. If something gets yeah. in there, they strip out. And if they strip out, they're a liability in the field. And that is not going to happen with these, with these nuts. And man, I, when I had no scope on the rifle and it was cold and windy out, I always reached for the night force because of that feature. And, and I'm sure that there's other ones, but I quickly became a huge fan of just tightening these down. And, um, generally I would put it to, to, to spec, the to torque spec. But if I needed to, I would just tighten it and I noticed no point of impact shift. So uh, they worked very, very well. The other thing that I like is that I want to put my rings as far apart in the action as I can. And yeah. it allows me to adjust it. Whereas with the one piece mount, it's harder to do that. And so to get the right uh, adjustment with your ocular lens and the right fit on your rifle, this kind of has to go where it goes. And there's only so much space that it'll fit in there and so you're yep. you're you're bound a little bit with the fitment of the rifle with a mount like this and and you have much more flexibility on this now just to give a little bit of insight to one of the tests that i'm doing is that i heard from an expert in the industry that the width of the ring now i i would have thought that the width of the ring, let me see if I have an empty one. Um, so like the Night Force heavy duties that run six screws, they are wider than the ones the, you have on there. Right. The, the wider, I would have thought, wow, that holds on better. It's wider. But what I heard and what I'm testing and trying to figure out how to, how to show, but I did hear that if this is narrow, it's going to have the same grasp and less distortion in the tube. And what we're trying to mitigate is optical distortions that can happen within the tube. And so with narrower rings farther apart, we're gonna have less optical distortion than big fat bands close together can influence not only parallax, but the function of the optical environment. Now, I haven't figured out a good way to test that, but I have seen that these skinny ones that are light uh, the scope doesn't spin. I torqued them to 15 inch pounds. So it's a little bit under spec Yep. and I can't get them to spin at 15 inch pounds rather than, than, uh, some people want to do it extra tight. And I'm trying to go as low as I can to try to get rotation in the scopes and, and everything that I've ever done, I've never had to retighten these at 15 inch pounds and the spec to them is 20. Um, yeah. Uh, just so you guys know, night four specs, they're, uh, scopes out at 20 inch pounds. Vortex says 18. Do not ever go over 18. Here's some other interesting specs you might want to know. The set screws for locking your turrets out, there's, depending on what model you have, on a night force, you're at four inch pounds. Four inch pounds is also the same number for the zero stop for the clutch on the internals. When you step up to a Vortex like the Razor HD, you are going to see numbers from Vortex at eight inch pounds. So you need to know your equipment, just like the spurs, the cross bolts on those. I think those are at 32 or 45 inch pounds uh, for the mains. And then, like I said, you need to know who, what's, whose scope you're putting in there because they're going to have different uh, inch pounds. Now, I know a lot of you guys might say, well, the Vortex, it doesn't matter. They have a lifetime warranty if I crush it. But I don't want I don't have the time to send my scope off. I'd rather just do it right and not worry about damaging it. Yeah. So I just wanted to add to that. Um, I know that you're a huge fan of fix it sticks. Um, you know, I use the Borka tools. I do have fix it sticks and they have their place. They're very, very good. They're very convenient. Um, but I know that you said that was the lifesaver out in the cold is being able to move stuff quickly. Yeah. 
I'm just trying to grab a different. Here's the zero compromise. Uh, I was here. Yeah, here's what we were talking about the 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 locking turrets. They pull up and push down. Yeah. Here's the zero compromise rings. Um, the fix it sticks to me. They were what saved the day every day in the field. At the end of the day, writing down all my notes, you know, I'm thinking scopes, I'm thinking impacts, I'm thinking atmospherics. But every time what, what I really saw was how many times I used the fix it sticks over and over and over again. I changed it. Right. I, I think that, that you can't underemphasize the importance of appropriate torque specs. I absolutely have ruined vortex scopes and sent them back to them because I over tightened them. I absolutely yeah. ruined other scopes because I over tightened them and, and they would send back a nice note. You over tighten these dum dum. And uh, they didn't say dum dum, but, but yeah. uh, you know, they, they said, gosh, you know what? Um, you know, everybody probably knew this already, but me, but, but the parallax stuff is in the tube here. So if you, cr if you crush the mechanism by over tightening this, your parallax stops working. You know, not only does it stop working, but the internal, and you can, if you over tighten these, just because they're made for the tube, you can still pinch this down and crush the, 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 the mechanisms that are in these tubes. Um, so tighter's not better. What, what's better is doing it exactly to spec and then um, taking it to the field and the reason that you wanted to over tight tighten it, you can kind of prove to yourself that that you don't need to do that, and that's why I've been tightening these down under spec, yeah, um, and and trying to prove to myself that it won't spin in the rings. And I'll put it in my rifle, and I'll kick my rifle over, and I'll put it in my rifle uh, standing up on the car, and I'll knock the rifle over leaning up against the car, and I'll say, "Gosh, you know what? Is it gonna?" lose it zero and and uh so far being under spec i haven't gotten them to spin in the rings and so everything that i thought would happen so far i've proven to myself that that's not going to happen I yeah now let's change gears for just a second we can come and revisit this but i know you said you're hard on equipment and you've broken a set of really right stuff tripods you've broken a two vets tripods uh what would be your choice of tripods right now? Would it be the two vets or a really yeah. right stuff? Two vets uh, and, and, and uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, there really is no downside to a two vets tripod and it, okay. it's a third of the price. And so if you've got a, a $500 tripod versus a $1,300 tripod and they perform equally well, the Occam's razor kind of analysis that you go through, why, you know, what, why would you, you know, all else equal, 500, 1300, what's the question to me, now, right? Now, what failed? What failed on them when you did get both of them to break? Uh, I got the, the lock-in mechanisms in the legs. Yeah, the plastic shim that's inside, that's uh, under I've, the collar. I've, yeah, I've, I've done uh, both. Let me, um, there, I've got, most of them are in my truck, but uh, let me grab a, this one has the shims broken and this one doesn't anymore. This one was fixed, but if you, if you take apart the legs, um, there's a couple, there's, there's a few different colors. And so, um, so in, the uh, yeah, I think it's a plastic collar with a hole in it. <laughs> yeah. So here's two parts of the really right stuff that, that cup together and there's a little hole that, that it sorts them in there. And then there's a, there's a notch and so they have to fit between those notches and then slide in. And so I've had those fail, but those, those are pretty easy to replace. They're little plastic tabs, but I, but I actually had this main collar on the tripod failed and it cracked and it pulled through this collar that, that comes up and ties onto it. So, um, and that was weird because there's a, it, it, if you look at it, it doesn't look like it would fit, but there's actually a ring that just falls right out. And let me, uh, I can get that to fall out for you here, I bet. If I just open this up, 
and then uh, there you go. This one just fell out. So it looks like there's no space, but it's actually an artificial uh, tight tolerance by putting in another uh, little piece here. And then now you see this big gap and you can, and, and if that fails in there, it'll actually pull through. And so I had that happen. And then in the stand, stand and shit gets in here and then this doesn't, this doesn't sh shut. But um, so th there's two parts that'll fail. The external collar, and when that happens, the leg just locks, you know, it doesn't open or close. So it's in a fixed position. And then when the collars on the inside that thread up, when those go out and they, and they do a lot, and I, I don't think that, I don't think it's possible for it not to happen, but, but I'll give you an example on the, the two vets. Uh, one. What's the difference in weight on those two, Chris? Uh, I know the two vets is slightly heavier. Yeah, it depends on the tripod. I'd have to get a scale out. Um, okay. This one, this this forty mic, is heavier than 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 this one. Um, but and that's what, the angle thirty ball head, which is probably the best ball head out there. Oh yeah, I mean, and and that yeah, that that's one thing that I, I've I've broken a lot of ball heads, but I've never broken an angle thirty ball head, and and yeah. the angle thirty here that, that's on this really right stuff tripod. It's, it's the same ball head that I put on um, the QDT. And so the, 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 the one that I take out, if I, if I have to go out and use a tripod uh, and I only want to carry one, I take the QDT and it, it's kind of long. I haven't tested their other long one that, that's a little bit shorter. Um, and somebody will say like, well, that's really long. <laughs> yeah. But, but it straps right on the side of your backpack. So, I, you know, it's not longer than a rifle. And so if you're yeah. going to throw a rifle in your backpack, uh, I, don't, um, I don't see why it would be an issue to have a tripod here. And the bags that I carry are typically mountaineering bags. And if you're going to put skis on the side of your bag or snowshoes or, or, um, or any kind of pole, then, then it really shouldn't – length really isn't an issue. What – what I found is the biggest factor in these, and, and some people pointed out that it wasn't comparing apples to apples, and I wasn't, but I don't care. I was just comparing what I could get by going to the store. And and when I reached out to really write stuff, they didn't have a tripod that I could buy that was a comparable tripod. So I just bought what I could get. But what I noticed is really important and, and I'm sure other people have seen the same thing is that the, the diameter of the base, right? This doesn't really have a leveling base and this does, this makes a big difference in stability. So if I take the same ball head and, and I put it on this, this wider base, um, like, like it's on this one, this is a really right stuff ball head. And, um, if I, uh, put it on this big leveling base, it's, it's straight up more stable. And so the diameter of this base has a huge difference in your rifle's ability to just stay still and being still allows you to shoot better. And I, and I was getting, you know, two to four tenths difference in, in group size, you know, 10 shot group size, just because of the different bases. So if I have a rifle that shoots a third of an inch, on this one, I would be getting a group size that was, um, you know, over an inch with, with that tripod. Yeah, Chris, I want to tell on you for just a second. So, guys, Chris is all about data collection. That's a huge thing with Chris. He actually has, and it's not a challenge, but it's a participation thing where you print off a target that he's got a link for you to print it and he wants you to practice at different positions and take note of it and basically they send that into you and then all of that is or they post it rather if you want to explain a little bit more of that but i know that's all about data position and everything else yeah so we, we i got the domain the craft uh, the reason i spelled it with a k wasn't because i like the cheese but I, I do like the cheese um but I'm, they're not sponsors so i'm not going to plug them too much 
<laughs> but in climbing, there was a tradition of strength um, related training and stuff. And a lot of that strength training came out of Germany and a lot of strength related training use of the word craft was spelled with a K. So uh, I can't get that down. You're just not strong enough. <laughs> I, got a I know I got a freaking get to it. The set screws is uh, tightened in there. Anyway. Uh, so rifle craft was with a K and um, the craft is with a K and, and so the domain riflecraft.com as one word with the dot and the com is where you can download uh, this test target. And the test target is a diamond. And I don't, I would have to run upstairs to get one, but I've, I've got hundreds and hundreds of targets that people have sent me and I'm analyzing shot consistency and performance of, of, of shooters in general, not because it's a competition and not because um, for any really externally motivated kind of reason other than just to understand how do people shoot and what's the easiest way to find somebody's low hanging fruit to fix their shooting as fast as possible. And when I started training for, um, for like the NRL type matches, I developed a training system for myself that was very close to what this challenge is. And, and I had a couple iterations beyond it. And I started to use that to figure out, you know, what, where in my shooting can I train and perform and get the quickest gains possible. And, and, and by taking that data on myself and it's applied to other shooters, I've been able to take some new shooters and get them pretty, uh, pretty effective at, at, at PRS NRL style, uh, competitions as well as myself. So, um, before, before this year, I had been trying to learn the NRL PRS style, because when I do the field matches, I would notice that, that shooting was a weakness of mine. And even though we got first place at the sniper adventure challenge and, and second and third, and I got second at team matches, I, I still felt like my performance overall as a rifleman was weaker in the competitive style that you see at the NRL and the PRS. And I struggled for a while to, to wrap my head around what it was. And, and so over the winter I trained that and I managed to come to the first match of the year this year and win it at rifles only, uh, doing this type of training. So I could say for me, it works. And then for a, a local shooter and, and friend of mine who started shooting this year, he went from, you know, like 120th in February, to 23rd at, at his last national match. You know. Yeah, and see, I'm going to agree with you 100% because me coming from the background of doing these military sniper matches, you know, winning them or finishing up in the top three for years and years, and then I want to try my hand at PRS, and I shot that match out in Utah, the Hornady PRC, I got my butt handed to me, um, and I, I realized that it is a different style, a different type of shooting that I would need to basically adapt to or train for. And so what's been good for me is, you know, right now ammunition, bullets, primers, all of that stuff to get. And so I've kind of embraced this whole 22, like this NRL 22 stuff. And, you know, we went out and all bought voodoos and everything else. I haven't talked to you since then, um, since, since we got all of this stuff, but what am I working on? I'm working on that same stuff because that's in the back of my hot, my mind. I got my butt handed to me out there and it was a different style of shooting. You know, whereas, you know, guys like you and me or myself and yourself, you know, a lot of that physical aspect is, I guess, the easy part for us. And we're decent riflemen. But when you go to PRS or NRL, those guys are dang riflemen. I mean, big time. You know, I mean, they're making some shots and I'm like, holy crud. This is, you know, first round hits right off the bat, 1375 with, you know, 20 mile an hour full value wind. And they're just banging them one after the other. That being said, what are you shooting cartridge wise? Are you shooting a GT, a Dasher, a Creedmoor? What are you shooting? Uh, right now, I shoot a BR, a BR, okay. uh, but I but I have a lot of calibers. I've got six five Creedmoor, I've got six five PRC, and and then then the um, the BRA. I've got a big bucket of uh, brass that I'm trying to process right now, but um, and then I'll train with a two two three, Ackley, 
or a, sometimes a 308 or 65 kind of depends on what I want to load. And then uh, I've got a Voodoo. So I've been, I've been trying to figure out what carries over from rim fire to center fire. Yep. And I've got a long list of things that I think it doesn't help with. And then a long list of things that I think it's probably okay to, to, you know, if you're a center fire match competitor, how do you train with the 22 versus what's not really helping you? Yeah. Um, so, so I've, I've been shooting, yeah, I've been shooting all those, but pr primarily uh, recently, uh, this is, this is just a dummy round, but, uh, but yeah, I've been shooting the BRA, which is a small, small cartridge, but it, it's what I gather personally is that the, the slower velocity, lighter recoil rifles in the type of matches that are available now tend to perform better. And if you look at the top shooters, they're all shooting uh, undercharged loads from smaller capacity cartridges and they're winning. And so that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I get this question a lot. I mean, I get guys that email me. They're like, you know, I want to get into this. I want to get me a 300 wind mag. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You need to research this. That's not the way it goes. And uh, can you shoot a PRS with a 6.5 Creedmoor? You absolutely can. Uh, you know, it was at one time the number one cartridge for PRS. But just like Chris said, guys, these smaller cartridges underpowered. Uh, everybody thinks you need this big, big velocity. Now I have certain velocities I like to reach. You know, I don't want to go out there with a little small cartridge, you know, pushing a hundred or pushing 2,600 feet per second. I mean, you do have to have velocity. Uh, I like that 2,800, 2,900 maybe range, you know, with like a 105 or something like that from what I've seen. But you don't have to be pushing 3,100 feet per second. That's not what's, what's going to do it. I mean, and you're standing by that 100 percent. what i just said and and i heard um i'm definitely i mean i i want a, a big match or you know a couple big matches but i wouldn't call myself a person who's worth listening to when it comes to load development and cartridge selection but yeah. i did hear uh, a precision rifle media podcast with austin orgain and i think i said his name right anyway i don't know him uh but but he just won the prs or maybe, he, no, he just won the AG Cup, but then he won the PRS last year. So anyway, he's a good shooter. And he threw out a statistic, and I'm probably butchering it, but I think he said that all the big money competitions last year were won with velocities under 2,900 feet per second. Exactly. All of them. And if that says anything, it's that the people that are winning – are good shooters, but there's a reason that those slower cartridges are working. And it's not because somebody justified it on a ballistics calculator. Cause if that was the case, we'd be shooting 300 wind mags, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. There's something about it, whatever it is, low recoil, slow bullet that's traveling consistently for the match designs that are popular. Now that works. Now that doesn't mean that match directors can't change the equation, but what yeah. works, what works now at PRS and NRL are these light recoiling, uh, small capacity rifles that, that, that tend to work. You know, they shoot now, good. Now, yeah, Chris, you might not know this, but there's actually a guy that's watching on here that built me up a six arc bolt gun. One of the first ones when the cartridge came out and Hornady was nice enough to send me ammunition. Uh, they sent me a couple cases. We couldn't get a gas gun at the time. So he spun me one up. And I was very, very impressed with that. The only problem I'm having, and you know, you're going to run into it as well, or you've run into it, is feed issues. Unless you get spacer kits and everything else and get it dialed in right, it wouldn't run 100% with those shorter cartridges. Oh, yeah, yeah. The the I, I run the MDT with the with the um, the fit kit spacer. Yeah, and uh, it's in one of these. Um, I've never had a feed issue, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, we ended up, and I'm running the XLR chassis on that as well, and we ended up going through MDT mags, but with that 6 arc, it's not a 308 parent cartridge. It's based off the Russian. So what we ended up finally finding that worked was the 224 Valkyrie mag from MDT. But it took a while to get there. It only holds eight rounds. doesn't hold 10, so you got to get a spacer for it. But that 6 arc falls within that. I mean, this isn't about six arc, but it's one of those smaller cartridges, lower recoil, 
you can run 105s and it's i mean your barrel life is incredible on those things yeah it sounds cool i, I love gas guns so i man i and I, I keep thinking about going to one of these big matches with i have a valkyrie and i man i love that valkyrie and if yeah. i have a chance on a team match i say god can i shoot gas like i don't care how we do I loved just going with a gas gun and just being the wind guy. And, and I just love that stuff. So I haven't shot the arc yet. And I know that ammo was the issue. Um, and also just trying to find builds early on and then COVID hit and I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, but, I mean, you can take six, five Grindel brass, boom, throw it in the die and it, you're good to go. <laughs> nice. Nice. Absolutely. Yeah. We thought it was going to be a lot harder, but it wasn't. But for anybody that's wanting to get into PRS or long range shooting, uh, what's, if you had to throw some key advice out there, what, what would it be? I, man, I, man, that's a good, that's a really good question. And it's a lot. <laughs> I think that um, when it comes to that, that style of competition, there's a lot of stuff. And most good people have had all that stuff, but don't, don't use it. And, and so I, I think that, um, Gosh, I think that you want a good barrel that was spun up by a reputable gunsmith. Not, um, there, there's plenty of good gunsmiths that shoot, and and I would go to a gunsmith that shoots these competitions with their rifles that that are reputable, and 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 spin up a good barrel for the action that you have, because accuracy. As far as I know and can tell, for this game, accuracy is coming from your barrel. So, so your action really probably doesn't matter. If you can run it and it can yeah. feed, like it's going to do a good job. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have expensive actions. But I've also got cheap actions, and if I put a good barrel on it, it shoots just the same. I have a Remington 700, uh, just a factory old Remington 700. It's never been blueprinted. And if I put a nice barrel on it, it shoots great. Yeah. And, and so the, the bolt knob on the Remington 700 is a little small. So you, you, the mechanics are a little bit different, but a good barrel spun up by a good gunsmith should be able to shoot fine. So if you're going to spend your money and if you have an old action, have a good gunsmith spin up a barrel for that action and then, uh, you know, get a bag and borrow everything else. Uh, if you go to a match, I mean, there, there's plenty of people that that I don't. I've met that I don't like at matches. I'm sure there's plenty of people that met me that don't like me at matches. But I've never, even those people, seen a situation where if somebody needed a piece of gear, the squad didn't just give you bags, give you tripods, give you anything that you needed that was, you know, a, additional to your rifle. Just borrow it. Say, man, I'm, I'm here. Here's my rifle. I don't know what to do. Uh, you need a you need a rifle that can shoot. Um, it doesn't need to be a quarter minute gun. As long as the thing, what I say is, if if you can consistently always shoot under a minute, you can compete. Oh, it, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. People don't want to believe that. They're they're thinking that you have to have this bug hole gun that shoots quarter minute. And th honestly, there's very few people that can hold a quarter minute. Um, as long as you can always hold under a minute, you can be competitive. Just do it. You know, go I'll out there you and shoot. I'm going to say something, not because it, it's unplanned, but I'm going to stick my neck out and and make a guess based on the data that I've seen from the craft challenge. So the the craft challenge, you know, is it, are these diamonds and they're numbered? It kind of looks something like that, and and you shoot it. You shoot. A shot standing, it could be supported, you know, just put your bag on a tripod, but it's from a standing height, a kneeling height, a seating height, and a prone height. If you, it, instead of sitting down, if you want to be in a super low kneel, knock yourself out. If you can do the craft challenge and your shots are within that six diamond, and then you can do a timed version of it based on the time is based on the, the widest ring. And I, I have a link to it on craft or on my YouTube channel for the, for the stress number. If you can shoot sub six, 
you'll be fine at a competition. Um, Sub six that, measures what? It, well, it's six MOA side. Oh, to side. six MOA. Okay, gotcha. But I, I've I've tested a lot of good shooters, the people that have have got trophies for you know multiple trophies, and no one scored sub one. No, no one has shot one MOA, period. No one. And I would say out of 600 shooters, I've seen two that are sub two MOA. Everyone else, they might have a sub two MOA group, but there's a point of impact shift. And, and so I think that the reality of shooting and, 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 and so let, let me back up here for a sec, because that, that might sound, that might sound weird because these people are still winning. They're still shooting. They're capable of small groups, but if you shoot, let's say that's a third of a minute group, right? And here was, here was your aim point. I don't, I don't call that a third of a minute group. I call that a one inch group because it's one inch from your aim point. Yeah. So if you shoot 12 rounds and you've got shots that are all over here, you know, this might be the three ring. And so far, you know, people being perfectly honest and, and everything is private when it comes to the data that I put out there. So that some people have shared it, but everybody's got a shot in the two ring. Most people have a shot that's breaching the three ring and they still have a good group. And a lot of those people are people that are getting, you know, top five at NRL and PRS matches. When you do the stress, it expands it a little bit. But I would say that you'll be top 50% if you could do the stress and keep it under 4 MOA. That would be my guess using the data that I've seen from hundreds of shooters. But if you could do the craft challenge and then do the craft uh, stress drill and you could keep it under the four ring, you're going to do really well at a, at a, at a NRL or a PRS match. Yeah. And see, this is great information to hear because that's one of the things that I try to stress to people. Now, granted yours is positional in shooting those. Whereas I'm just talking about somebody that's, you know, prone position, they're shooting their rifle. They don't need a gun. That's, you know, a half minute in order to do this. Someone pointed that out just a minute ago. You know, when you're shooting these matches, a hit on the edge of the steel counts the same as the center. It doesn't matter, <laughs> you know. Yep. So it's good to hear that. Um, let's see. Let I think the, aver one. the average distance, I think, um, is about 700 yards from from the matches that I've seen. So I don't yep. think you need to prepare yourself too much for taking a shot at a thousand or twelve hundred or fourteen hundred. And if there's a match and you go to it and there is a shot at 1,400, you're talking about one stage with one target. Out of, so out of 200 shots that you're going to take, you might take four or five shots that are very far out of 200. So if we're talking about percentages, I would hedge your bet at being able to have your highest percentage around 700 yards. And yeah, so I don't even think about it. If I, I got my BR and my BR shoots 2,800, somebody is going to argue with me that at 1,400 yards, you know, the BR group is going to be this big and the six Creedmoor is going to be this big. You can have my points on those stages because almost all of them are going to be scored at 700 yards. So I would make the most of your decision making around that 700 yard mark and don't worry about the far stuff because. Yeah. It's a it's a fraction of points, and if and if if a ninety percent wins the match out of two hundred shots, there's twenty shots that are lost. Those twenty shots, they could be the far ones. They could be you know whatever. You just kind of like all right, sweet. You're, if if you hit the far ones, you're psyched. If you don't hit them, make sure that you're focused on the the nearer range stuff and that you're capable of standing, kneeling, and and you know, also some prone, but, but I would say that once you understand the effects that you have on your rifle system in different positions to cause a point of impact deviation, 
once you can kind of wrap your head around that, now you can start to work on your shooting and bringing that stuff onto target because um, it's not the same as a bench. Yeah, Joe M. commented and said at the finale, the PR, I guess the PRS finale that they were having that was brutally cold and snowy, the average distance was less than 600 yards. Yeah. I mean, so there you go, guys. Over trying to develop a load that would kick ass at 1,400 yards, you know, that, that was time not, not best spent. So um, I think that, that you know, there, there's a lot of confusion. And at 600 yards, a 308 doesn't do too bad either. Um, yeah. Probably, Absolutely. If I had the option, I probably wouldn't. But if, yeah, I wouldn't worry about a 308. But it's going to be because of the recoil, being able to spot your shots. That's the only reason, correct? Yeah. 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 I mean, you got to be able to read wind. and But but again, the average distance at a match like we're talking about, even though everybody wants to talk about 1,000 yards, that's a small percentage of the overall shots that you're going to take. What you're going to have to be able to do is know that you got your fancy, you know, rifle set up. And if you shoot a quarter inch group, two inches off the right, you know, because that's your positional shift. Um, it wasn't wind, right? It was yeah, exactly not that, that that was the impetus for this craft challenge is to say that you affect the rifle and the inputs way more than anything else. Let's start to come to grips with our effect on our rifle systems. And if you can bring a one inch gun center, you'll have the highest score in the country with a one yeah. inch gun, but nobody's done it yet. And I guarantee some of these guns that have taken this challenge are quarter minute guns. Yeah. And they're still, they're still scoring, you know, threes. Yeah. Um, so, so guys, the takeaway from this is, and this would be my advice. I know Chris hasn't quite gotten there yet, but it's work on the positional stuff. Just like you said, you might have a gun that can actually shoot and hold a quarter minute. And if everything's dialed in, that's good. But the minute you start going into that kneeling position or that barricade position or shooting off of a cattle fence, you don't need the thousand yards there. Those are going to be 400, 500, 600 yards. You still have to read the wind and it doesn't take much. You know, we put it on the channel where we were practicing those positions to show you because number one, you're going to probably time out before all you get before you get all of your shots off because it's going to take you longer to get set up and to be ready to actually pull that shot that you might miss anyway. So work on the positions. I know, Chris, you do a lot of positional training, right? Tons of it. Yeah, exclusively. Yeah. yeah, because you know that's where the downfall is. That's the time sucker, and that's where you're going to make the misses. It's not the distance. It's just you're not in a stable position. No, 90% of my shooting, at least 90% of my shooting, for precision long range rifle is at a hundred yards on paper, 90% or more. I train okay. at a hundred yards on paper. Now I know uh, this is going to be a loaded question because you're sponsored by them, but if you had to pick one bag to go to a match with, what would it be? I like the get light Armageddon gear, uh, game changer, OG game changer. I did a big test with a bunch of bags and the get light, OG game changer had the exact same group size uh, over over lots of rounds. I mean, I, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, of test rounds. There was no difference between the heavy one. So, you know, when, when all else is equal, go with the cheaper. And when all else is equal, go with the lighter. Uh, the, the, those game changers to me have performed flawlessly. And I've Do been you run a plate on your rifles? No. Okay, no. so you're not one of these guys that's running a plate at all. You're just throwing the game changer up, getting in position, and going. Yeah, I've borrowed plates from people, and I have um, somewhere around here. I have one of those little ones, but I've never got it to work very well. Yep. Uh, people that like the tripod rear support, and they put it on the thing, and they use the barricade and do that. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to train myself so that I could just throw down a bag and a rifle and be yep. as effective. And I'm gonna. I've been looking at this. Uh, I have like, you know, all these uh, folders with datas and targets, but I'm going to show you like, you know, a day-to-day -day shooting practice is going to look something like this for me. And I'll, I'll have a target that I'll print out and I'll go and, and I'll, um, you know, I'll say uh, game changer. Um, uh, this is, this was actually testing a plate and a bag. So I got uh, 
you know, game changer. And I add a horizontal bar. I'll take these tripods and I'll put one of the legs horizontal so that it's a really narrow, um, uh, right. I'll lift up the leg like this and put it on something so that when I put the bag on it, it's not a table and it's not a, a four by four or something. This is a, you know, it's a narrow barricade essentially. So that's wobbly. And, and then I'll test, um, uh, plates and bags and then um and then i'll do it uh off of wobblier things and, I, and i'll and i'll test them absolutely and then i'll look at point of impact shifts that i'm inducing and then i'll train those point of impact shifts not for group size but to center up on my point of aim to me a big part of my training involves first bringing my group centered up on my point of aim and once it's centered up on my point of aim, then I'll work to reduce the size. But I don't care if it's a small group three inches off the target. What I want is a group that's first centered over the target, and then I'll work on shrinking it up. And that's been validated by the data from the craft and that there's plenty of small groups, but none of them are centered over their point of aim. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, so let me, let me ask you this. Here's a group, right? And, and I do, I typically do five shots, but here's a really good group, right? Right here. But it's not centered over the target. It's high, right? But yeah, exactly. So this group, if, 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 uh, you know, in my mind, what I see is, is a group that's this big, right? And yep. I think that when I look online, I see a lot of people saying, oh, I got this shit hot little group. But what I see here is a ring around their point of aim. And I don't see that that group's any different than these. This group to me is the exact same as this group. And that's kind of how I'm trying to restructure my mind into saying like, that doesn't mean much to me. That, that means more to me than this because this is centered around my point of aim. And if I could shoot like that, I'd win a match, right? But um, that's the hard part is trying to replicate that at a match. If you could shoot like that all the time, yep. you'd win a match. And that's okay. that's over an inch. That's a little bit over an inch. But if you could do this under stress, you would walk away with the first place trophy. Period. Yeah, and guys, remember, that's a 100-yard group. We're not talking about a long ways on paper. You're doing all your tests at 100, correct? Yep, yep. And so this group to me is the same. It's it's a big – it's not a little group. It's a big group. What you're not seeing is that, that, that you have to take your point of aim into consideration and then draw a circle around it, and, and that's the size of your group. No, now, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Now, if you print 100 rounds there, I think that indicates that you need to work on, a, on you know, bringing whatever you're doing with your natural point of aim to bring that group to center versus a big group. You want to try to shrink it up with some, some other fundamentals. But to me, the point is we need to think about our point of aim first <laughs> and in that regard, a one inch gun could win a match. Factory ammo can win a match. Um, Absolutely. I've been preaching it for almost a year now. Um, you know, not chasing that gun. That's just printing the little teeny tiny groups. It's you give me a one inch gun or one minute of angle gun. I said, you can shoot any match there is. Yep. But and probably win it. <laughs> you have to be able to shoot that one inch gun, one inch. Correct. And, I, I read, um, where's that book? Uh, oh, the, the Long Range Shooting Handbook when I was starting by Kleckner. Yep. And I, I don't, I think he says it in there, but I also listened to him on podcasts and he says, um, you know, like, you know, people talk about small stuff, but he's a one MOA shooter. And I remember thinking like, wow, that's not very good. And now, that seems like an unattainable level. It, that seems if, – if, if I could be a one MOA shooter under all conditions, I would lose my shit. That is so <laughs> good. And I've never seen it. 
I've never seen a one MOA shooter under all conditions. Yeah. Ever. And, and, um, that would be remarkable. So I would de-emphasize gear. That doesn't mean that gear isn't important. Your optic is really important. And, and I broke a lot of optics the last two years because they were cheap and something broke and something or other. What, what's most important for this game is that it's not going to break. And that when you dial, it's going to be consistent. So if you if if you if you take your turret and you crank it up till it's and then crank it all the way back, and then you crank it all the way back up, and then you crank it all the way back, and you do that all the time to the zero stop to the zero, it's always going to go back to zero wherever my zero is, right? But you can't be afraid of testing your equipment beforehand. If your scopes can't do that, they're going to fail you at a match, and you're just going to waste a bunch of money, and then that's frustrating. To me, that's really frustrating. 100% agree. Like what you just did with the turrets, yeah. when I set up someone's scope for them, I will actually take them and do that. And I'll spin the turrets like this just to see if we do have a return back to zero. And some of these people, I mean, they want to slap me in the face. They think I'm damaging it, but that's what they're designed to do. And yeah. if it won't do it, you're already starting off on the wrong path. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's made to make these sounds, right? And and yeah. they didn't give me these, you know, uh, I bought these and I'll buy them again and I'll continue to do that. If all these scopes, if you can't do this all the way up and then all the way down, and if it's on zero, it should always go back to zero. Now, the other thing that I like to do that's different than the tall target stuff, because that's, I gather that's very hard to actually set up to do appropriately. So one thing that I do, uh, and I'm sure other people do it, is I'll dial up to something and I'll shoot. And then I'll dial back to zero. And then I'll hold over what I dialed. And, and that's how I'll compare tracking. And that's how yeah. I'll compare, rather than, trying to get the angle just right and then measure the actual distance. And with the range finder, you could be off plus or minus a foot, which is going to, you know, or three feet or whatever. And, and it's like, man, you know, am I at a, at, am I at a hundred yards or am I, at, you know, 98.5 yards and is the angle just right? And you're worried about all that, like, forget it. If I do a shot and that's what I've done everywhere else with the environmentals is you know, I'll figure out the range, I'll dial to it, I'll shoot, I'll dial back to zero and I'll hold over. And those bullets better be in the acceptable group size for that particular, you know, if I'm dialing and shooting and my group looks like this, it shouldn't be any different when I dial and it shouldn't be any different when I hold over. And that should be the case for everything. And it should always go back to zero. That's what you're paying for. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we have a commenter who said, no, you have to tap. Now you have to tap on them to work. These aren't ACOGs. Uh, so, you know, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of guys, when they put in any corrections, you'll see them tapping on the sides. And the only time I've ever seen that, that's an issue. Of course, ACOGs used to do it back in the day. They actually taught knocking on the side of it. But if your erector tube got hung up, sometimes it could relieve some of that tension. It could spring back into place. Some of the cheaper scopes, I've seen somebody make an adjustment. They shoot it. Nothing happens. But the <laughs> recoil from the shot then releases everything, and then it will be on with the correction. What you're paying for, if you set it well, is that repeatability and that reliability of those optics. Uh, nobody wants to spend, you know, three to $4,000, but that's what you're paying for because it must work. Yeah, yeah. And if you have a scope that doesn't track right, but you've got a good reticle in it, then just hold over. Just hold. And, yeah. And, you know, there, there's workarounds for having scopes that don't do. And, and, and I've certainly, have, I've gone to competitions with scopes that didn't track right. And I, I've adjusted the BC to accommodate for the tracking, but then you can't hold, you can't hold over the same as you dial. And so I, to me, the answer would be, if you have a shitty scope, then just do holdovers and yeah. and until you can get something where you can dial. But it, it's pretty hard to get the level of precision holding over consistently that yep. you can get from dialing. And, and I even dial wind 
most of the time because I don't want to worry about, you know, I want to try to, you know, I want to rely on the equipment that can hold better than I can. And I just want to worry about trying to hold my reticle on the target as still enough as possible. And man, that's hard enough with the center of my reticle than trying to trying to, you know, line up all sorts of stuff because I'm trying to shoot an inch and it's hard to shoot an inch when it's hard to see what, what you're looking at. So I've been actually spending a lot of time dialing elevation and wind and just trying to hold center. And that way, you know, if I do miss, I can make my adjustment with my wind and know kind of mathematically, okay, I adjusted two tenths and then that's good. Now I can do the wind formula stuff. And, and if the turrets don't do that, man, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> you yeah. know? And Chris, this is great information. You got me thinking about a post that you posted on social media the other day. So I'm going to, I'm just going to off the top of my head, ask you some questions, simple one word answer. And here we go. MOA or Mills? Either. Favorite bipod? Skypod. Shoes or boots? Shoes. No question. What, what type of shoes? Running shoes? Cross country type shoes? What are we talking about? Doc uh, Martens? La Sportiva Bushido. I've got pairs all over the place. Uh, my treadmill is right behind here. Uh, La Sportiva Bushidos are probably the best overall shoe in existence. They've got like a boot shank in the sole. they got sticky rubber. Uh, they dry off when they get wet. They perform really well. I got fat feet, so they're a little narrow on my feet, but I don't I don't even care. They just work perfect. Okay. For PRS, spotting scope or binos? Binos. I don't even own a spotting scope. There you go. Okay, so that's another good one. This one came up uh, about a week or so ago. And I'm seeing the use, the usefulness of a spotting scope is kind of diminished now. And I'm a huge bino guy, always has, always have been. The only thing that I would say that the binos lack, at least the ones that I have, is if you're out at a known range with friends and you're trying to give them corrections, a lot of bino binoculars don't have reticles. They might have laser range finding and all this other stuff, but giving them an instant come up or a correction, that's the only downfall. Now, I think Steiner's, I have some with the reticles in them and you know, there's some military ones that have them, but most people aren't buying those. Yeah. I heard that, um, Leupold had some binos with a reticle. I don't have any with a reticle. Uh, I've been using the fury 5,000 range yep. finding binos from vortex, yep. but oh man. Yeah. I don't, why carry extra shit? You know, you can see really well with the binos and then you just get on your glass. And okay. Favorite, pack non-rifle bearing oh black diamond uh, i love their their uh let me grab it it looks like a haul bag um oh that was the night force uh <laughs> hey they're built for it freak 50 yeah i'm not worried about it uh i used this at the the sniper adventure challenge actually uh when um Let's see. When we got second place, I used this bag. Uh, it's like a haul bag, essentially just one giant cavity. Um, but it's called the Creek 50, and it's like a haul bag. It's got a big bottom, and it's Cordura. Anyway. Now, for that match, it was a 48-hour match, but you guys covered between 30 to 60 miles. I think correct? we covered like 60, close to 70 miles on that match, yeah. Yeah, in two, basically a 48-hour period. So a lot of guys opt to go through the night, keep running through the night. Uh, other guys rest. Did you guys rest or did you just keep going? No, you, you can't do well and rest. Uh, yeah. You have to move the whole time for sure. Yeah, I think last year, I think 2020, and I could be wrong on this, but I think the, the you didn't make last year, I guess, because all the COVID stuff. Wasn't that one by a former um, uh, SEAL? I don't know. Yeah, I think they did it in 36 hours, and they said it was 100% go time the whole 36 hours. There was no resting. There was no stopping. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a little bit of a create-your-own-adventure. That uh, You'll get – usually the format is you'll show up, you'll get a map, and then they'll tell you how 
it's going to unfold and it unfolds a little different every time. So you can't really prepare in advance all that much other than being fit enough and, and, and trying to be well-rounded, but, but um, you know, they might, they might give you a list of, of navigation points and, you know, say, well, you need to get six out of 10 to move on and, and, um, or, or you, you need to accomplish these things in this time window or, or, or something like that. But in order to do well, well, certainly in order to be a finisher, um, which is different than, than winning, um, you have to move the whole time. Um, yeah. there's, there's just no question. You, you, the, the equipment list has sleeping stuff, but typically you'll bring stuff that you wouldn't want to sleep in because it's so light. And then you just move the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, no- Mr. Lovell makes this comment. Now this is coming from two guys that were into rock climbing pretty heavily. And he said, remember when 511 made rock climbing gear? Yeah. Now, I know that's where the name originated because guys, so like a 511, uh, that's going to take somebody that's basically there's a rating scale. And of course, you know, Chris has been doing this a long time. I was into it really, really heavy, maybe not to the point where he has, because I never did any ice climbing or anything. But basically, you have these grades for how hard a climb is. So you might have a 5.8. A lot of times a 5.8 won't even be in a guy, but then it goes 5.9. And then at some point, and it depends on what manual you're looking at or whatever, you might have a 5.10 will go a 5.10 A, B, C, or a D. A 5.11 is going to take an accomplished climber. You're not going to do this right off the bat. Most people that have never rock climbed are never going to be able to do a 510. Wouldn't you agree on that? Now we're talking about, you know, top rope. I mean, you're going to, at 510, you can, I've, I've climbed stuff with boots on a 510, but when you get into that 510D, you're, you're at that point, you're going to probably want some climbing shoes. 511, I believe, and this is where the name originated from, is 511, the way that it was, the description is, is on first observation, the climb doesn't look that possible. But upon studying it and basically coming up with a solution, it can be, you know, it's, it's, it's doable. Now, in the height of my climbing, the best I could do was 511D. That was it. I, I never could climb a 512 in my life. Uh, you know, I might free hang and free hang and try to solve it. I don't know where you're at. We've never talked about rock climbing, Chris. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? I've never, I didn't know 511 ever did rock, rock climbing gear. Oh yeah. They started as rock climbing gear. Um, the, um, he's friends with the owner of Reveille Ranch and I was, okay. working, I did some work down there, uh, you know, before all this and, and we were hanging out talking, I was teaching some tower stuff and, yeah. um, and we got to talking about 511 gear, but they just didn't, they just didn't break into the climbing world like they'd hoped. Yeah. And the tactical world somehow just, it was kind of a luck thing and they decided, shit, we it up. and man, sometimes you just can't, you can't pick your population. And, yeah. and, 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 and at least, you know, at the time that that's kind of how it went was, you know, he's into climbing, love climbing, made good climbing gear, but the people that really wow. loved it at the time, was the tactical crowd tactical world and yeah and that, you paid the bills and so it stayed that way yeah gotcha okay yeah now most of the climbing that you do if you're not if you're if you're climbing and i know this has went from guns but we'll just change gears for just a minute here um are you doing mostly like lead climbing are you doing trad all of it what, do you, what are you doing primarily it, it's a lot of it is seasonal um okay I, you know because of shooting i haven't been climbing as much as I, I used to, but it's probably more than, than most people. We still climb three days a week. Okay. So that's three or four days a week. Um, and this time of year, in, I live in Colorado, so you can climb year round. And, and unless it's raining or snowing, you can get on rock typically and climb uh, because the, the, you know, the weather's nice and it's usually sunny. Yeah. Um, and, and, it just depends on the cliff, whether I'm going to do trad climbing or, or sport climbing. And, and even you can go, um, you know, rock climbing the same day that you have up a canyon and, and ice climb. Yeah. So uh, it just depends on the conditions. The ice, there's so many people around here that climb on ice that it gets chopped up 
You know, yeah. I mean, the ice, you know, it flows down and it, and it freezes and it's smooth. But as soon as people start climbing on it with the picks, that doesn't go away very quickly. And once it gets picked out, it's not very fun to climb on. So um, if I can get up a canyon before people have climbed on stuff, I'll climb on it. You know, but otherwise I like the rock stuff better. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to let you kind of close it out. I'll give you the screen here if you want to just talk to the guys, give them any advice or anything else, um, any links to any channels, any social media or anything like that. And the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, I appreciate being able to come on here and, and shoot the shit. You know, Ray and I, we talk all the time, but it's nice to be able to talk and reach out to people that, that may or may not be familiar with the kinds of things that, that we like to do. Um, because I'm training for Assassin's Way, I've, I've just recently in the last two months shifted towards posting on Instagram as Gun Around the Sun and posting on YouTube as the craft and the targetry stuff that we're developing. If you want to start doing that, uh, it's, it's absolutely free. And all of it is dedicated towards analyzing your shooting capabilities and trying to get a realistic perspective on how you're shooting and, and what does that mean relative to the larger population of shooters. And you can, you can see that it, it's just starting to come out but that's at riflecraft.com. You can print out the targets and see links to the videos explaining how to shoot the targets and think about it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm usually pretty excited to talk. Sometimes my posts seem like I want to argue, but mostly that's just for fun to get people excited. I really don't want to argue. I just want to talk about how you shoot and how you use your equipment. You saw that, you know, this knife force just fell two feet off of a bench and and I, you know you'll see me in the snow banging it around and using it because I want to know what the equipment that I plan on taking to the field uh, that I'm you know investing all my time and energy into doing. I want to make sure that that equipment doesn't fall apart on me when it matters. And and so I've dedicated the next year uh, full time to testing shooting equipment, training myself, and going out to environments to. Uh, to find out, you know, what's true and what isn't true and what works, what doesn't work, and how can we figure out how to be better and more effective at the things we're trying to accomplish rather than just turning to, to threads or chat groups or, or message boards that, that, that you can't really vet the source of that information. So I'm kind of trying to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, by going out there and actually taking tips from people and then trying to mythbusters it to see if it actually works. And when it comes to physical stuff, you know, that that's just sweat equity. And when it comes to shooting stuff, uh, I think the, the proof is, is paper at a hundred and, uh, just getting rounds downrange in different environments. And so that's, that's kind of what the craft channels moving towards. Uh, but but we're just starting because I've, I've also just started to learn how to edit videos and I'm kind of a knucklehead when it comes to that. Yeah. So, you know, his channel of uh, the craft on YouTube is is new. Like I said, he started in September. I think he's got about 20 videos out. But if you're that person that really wants to get to the source of the data, uh, he's a good place to go check for sure. As far as I guess you're on. I hate to say it, but I guess you're on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and all that. I've been thinking about getting rid of my Facebook. I don't know if I even want to be on there anymore. But uh, like I said, we don't get into politics and all that. But either way, it's been a pleasure having you on. I think there was a lot of knowledge shared. And I think a lot of the viewers, we have 138 viewers in here. I hate to cut it short, but I was only going to do this for an hour. And I didn't want to take time out of Chris's night and his family to do this because this was very impromptu. We put this together in what, two and a half hours. It was yeah. like, Hey, you available tonight? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, guys, I want to thank each and every one of you and uh, big thanks, big thanks to Chris for, for joining on the channel. Maybe we'll have you again in a year or so, or another couple of months, or maybe we'll be able to shoot. We meant to try to shoot last year as a team. It didn't work out. And I think I brought a new shooter. You brought a new shooter. We both had a good time, but uh, yeah. it just worked out that way. That'd be great so, to shoot a team match. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Look forward to it. So, guys, we're going to say good night. I hope you guys have a great evening. Uh, don't jump off just yet, Chris. We'll talk to you soon, guys. Have a good week.